I like watching Hollywood burn. I, you know, <laughs> watching Hollywood's new shows come out and they suck. And, you know, me and my friends are making stuff that everyone <laughs> likes and is resonating with them. And I, I think I like the com competition element of that. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. I'm delighted to say our brilliant guest today is the comedian Ryan Long. Ryan, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you for having me, guys. Uh, listen, man, it's great to have you on. A lot of our audience have been clamoring for us to talk to you because you've been putting out some great stuff uh, during the last year, the pandemic, etc. Before we dive into all of that, talk about comedy and more, tell everybody a little bit about who are you, how are you where you are, what has been your journey through life that leads you here? Cool. I, I was... Uh... So when I was pretty young, I was in like a pretty successful band in Canada. And then I kind of was doing all these DVDs, jackass kind of style stuff. And Tom Green was huge for me. And then I took, uh, I ended up doing a TV show in Canada, kind of based on that stuff when I was doing all these DVDs with the band and stuff. Um, in that time, I started doing comedy. So that would have been like 11 or 12 years ago. I started doing stand up and I was doing TV shows and sketch comedy. And I did uh, a, a series at the CBC. I built up the video department for the bit, bit, thing called, a website called The Hard Times. Then I moved to America uh, about a year and a half ago, kind of right before the pandemic and started doing my own stuff here. And then now I'm just kind of doing my own YouTube channel and touring and stuff as a comic. Mm. And you're crushing it. And one of the things I found really interesting is a lot of your stuff at the moment is you, people would say is political. You talk about woke culture, some of the flaws with that way of thinking. Uh, you've talked about the restrictions around lockdowns and the pandemic. But actually, you say you're someone who's not political in the sense you don't care who the president is, etc. Is that broadly accurate? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a lot of people that are probably in a similar position in that I talk about culture and that's what I talk about. And I think most importantly, I talk about people and the psychology of people and, you know, stuff like that. And politics has infiltrated every single facet of the world, right? I mean, especially during the Trump years, there wasn't anyone that wasn't talking about all that stuff, right? So it's impossible to separate the two. So it's not that I'm completely, um, you know, it, it's impossible to ignore. And I went through, when I was in university, I went to school for economics and I went through my phase where I was, in all, you know, very into all that stuff and, and I had my perspective or whatever. And then it kind of, it came back around um, now, but I think a lot of times there's there's there are some people that really are part of, you know, we want our side to win. And I think that I'm usually talking about that stuff. But more importantly, I'm talking about the psychology of the people that are like that. So even in my videos, like when you talk, if you, you mentioned that I mentioned I talk about, you know, cancel culture, woke stuff or whatever. Let's say that's one of the things. Right. I'm generally talking about the type of person that does that you know, and, and the psychology behind them and what they do. And I think that's kind of generally what I'm poking fun of. One of the things that just to kind of elaborate on that or whatever, but one of the things I think I was thinking about a lot this week is, and this is why it's gotten like this is because there's probably, I don't know if you saw this, but Glenn Danzig, who is like the, the misfits guy, he's like a big punk guy. He kind of came out and he said that, you know, his songs wouldn't be able to be made right now or punk wouldn't have happened because of, you know, woke bullshit is what he said. And obviously the, the punk community flipped out and never, what, you know, he's just old. He don't get it, whatever it is. Right. And it's kind of, and, and by the way, the lyrics of it were, you know, I'm going to rape your mom and stuff like that. So it was, I don't even know why it would be, you know, they don't like the way he said that, but it's pretty obvious that yes, for sure that couldn't have happened right now. Like none of them would have been, been for it, but all those, a lot of those people like that band. And I think that once you control people's identity, you kind of control everything about them. So let's say I go, I'm a punk or I'm a, I'm a this. And then all, once people think that, then all you have to say is, well, guess what? People who are that think this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of, you know, I, I've even said, you know, like guys like Brett Weinstein and stuff like that, mm. how they're always having that conversation. You know, I'm actually a liberal, but, you know, the word liberal has changed a lot and these words always change. Right. So I think that's why I never really attach myself to I'm this or I'm that because they change every two years. And, you know, realistically, who you are is, you know, going to change at a slow pace, but things can change rapidly. And if the words that define you 
or how you see yourself the most important thing, then you're just beholden to other people's definitions of who you are. And I think that's where a lot of people are at right now. It's a very interesting point you make, uh, Ryan. Now, let's be honest, in the comedy industry, most people would describe themselves as liberal, you know, in inverted commas, as it were. Do you think that's where the industry is now? And how do you see yourself in the industry? Well, so even to go back to my original point, you said most people in entertainment or comedy, whatever, describe themselves as liberal. Like, so is that because most people that are liberal get into entertainment or was it because once you get into entertainment, that's a requirement is that you're this. They go, well, if you're if you're an artist, you're obviously this. So people go, oh, OK, because they didn't want to lose the identity that they're an artist. So if you said, hey, I want to be in a punk band and you go, well, all punks think this. You go, OK, well, I'm that now, you know, so hmm. if that became like a secondary term that got attached to people that want the first, you know, want to be able to attach the first identity to themselves. Do you think it's become more intolerant, though? Because before, like when I started comedy disclosure in 2009, and it was a very, very different landscape back then. Back then, it was, you know, more to do, everybody wanted to be sort of like a shock jock comedian. Say yeah, the, the edgy era. Yeah, yeah. Say the most outrageous thing. Not your possible. grandmother's comedy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me tell oh, you. I'm please. sorry. <laughs> exactly. Whereas now it seems we've got, we've flipped over completely on the in the other side. Yeah, I think that there's probably a good. Um, it's probably worth making the definition between mainstream comedy and comedy. So, mm. I mean. Yeah, if you're talking about like Hollywood and movies and TV shows that are made by the, you know, corporate comedy industry. Yeah, they've got a very specific perspective. But then there's also a counterculture that, you know, is kind of against that, which, you know, you guys would be part of. You have an audience. I'm doing very well. So there's always a counterculture. And a lot of times things were originally a counterculture. And you can even see what we're talking about. OK, so. Perfect example. That was sort of like a hipster counterculture at one point mm. being, you know, uh, against America. It was almost like a, a mix between libertarian and, you know, kind of edgy liberals, right? Mm. Where we're against the government and we're, you know, against racism, it, whatever, like, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? And then now you saw, you still kind of see this counterculture and you probably say the biggest person in that field would be like Joe Rogan. You know, I would say that's the the biggest person in that whole field and he's made a lot of careers or whatever. So if you now look at that, you'll see Fox News and places like that kind of attaching themselves to that counterculture, right? So, and then, you know, they're trying to say it's a right left thing, but it's not, it's always a kind of freedom versus authoritarian thing, right? And you'll see other people the same way that they attach them, like the whatever mainstream corporate America attached themselves to that. And you see the same reason you see that you know, Axe Body Spray's got ads about racism or whatever it is, right? When, you know, what were they? They were literally the, you know, company three years ago that was like, you know, have sex at a frat. You know, that was their <laughs> motto, basically, right? So it all, it changes. And you'll see that other people that sort of take what movements are and it happened and then uh, chew them up and spit them out. And it happened, it's, it happens most purely in music, but in comedy, it probably happens more pronounced because in comedy, the the your opinions are the product a lot of times, right? So what your opinions are are the product. So once they kind of co-op that, then they then they own everything, and all they have to be is like, what were all those kids saying that it's been <laughs> going popular? Oh yeah, we're that now. <laughs> well, I, I I really think it's funny to to watch because, um, you know, sometimes you'll say that, uh, let's say I'm, I'm assu I assume you guys are always, a, you know, a lot against the people that are clamping down on freedoms, especially in mm. speech and all that stuff. And, you know, as am I. And so you, I, I, I did like a Fox thing, right? And these people, they're very like, you can't say anything anymore, right? They're kind of saying, you know, what the chewed up and spit out version of what probably people like you were saying. They go, you know, you're not allowed to say anything anymore. I go, first of all, I, I'm not allowed to swear on this very interview. Mm -hmm. And I go, go watch a Bill O'Reilly clip from six years ago. It's him interviewing, you know, the insane clown posse being like, but aren't your hurt words hurtful? Like this should not be, you know, exact same thing. It's just repackaged because, you know, they have less power in, in, in censorship probably right now. Mm. I think you're you're so right about that. I think there is a lot of sort of jumping on bandwagons from from both sides, and that, that's what I always found quite frustrating. I don't know if people try to do this to you, but the, I found the moment you start speaking out 
and going, actually, maybe it is important that people should be say what, be able to say what they think or make the jokes that they want. Suddenly, everyone's like, you're right wing. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, how, well, how did that happen? When did being for freedom become a right wing thing? Do you do people well, try to Well, it became put you when the they polarized everything, when they decided that, you know, if you're a liberal, here are the 12 things you think. And if you're a conservative, here are the 12 things you think. And most people aren't like that. Like everyone has their group of friends and maybe this guy's a little this on this issue and everyone sort of talks about things. So the idea that if you if you're part of this identity, here's the 12 things you think and they do it with race, they do it with gender, they do it with jobs. You know, if you're, you know, the old, you know, even with people who are against the cops, there's this code among cops of like, you don't say this to this person and that's kind of how they operate. But more importantly, it kind of becomes uh, when, so when you're doing it the other way, like what you're talking about when they're trying to shut it down, that's that idea that let's make a thing that you're not, you don't, that it's not acceptable to be. And then once we've got on board with that, let's put everyone in that group. So, <laughs> and, but they don't update, like, you know, it's the thing they go, everyone's conservative. That's what they're saying. Anyone I disagree with is conservative. And they mm -hmm. kind of know that in their little faction of the world, they don't have to tell you why they're wrong. All they have to tell you is this, and then they already know it's wrong. So it's sort of like a, a cheap way to argue about people with people is you just tell them they're this group that you don't like. You know what I mean? If imagine you were talking about sports in a bar and uh, I don't know, we probably know different teams because I'm, mm. you know, I'm from Canada and I live in America and you guys are from, but the, you know, if you were team a and you're arguing with the players and you go, dude, he's a friggin' Leafs fan. He, he's not going to, you don't care what he says. That's all you would have to say is he's a Leafs, he's a Leafs fan or Manchester fan. And then his opinions no longer valid. Right. And then he might be like, no, I'm not. I it doesn't matter. They just, so they put you in that box. And then the other way is when they're doing it on your side. And I think John Stewart actually was set up pretty good version of this back in the day that I always kind of think probably summed it up best. He goes, people that are always going to weaponize you. So, you know, it's, you'll see the same people get weaponized both ways, like a Bill Maher type. You'll see every now and then liberals being like, look, this is, you know, this is ah, in your face. And then you'll see the conservatives <laughs> being like, ah, like, and he kind of switches back and forth, but everyone likes to use him. And I think for a while, comedians specifically were sort of looked at as an impartial source. So, so it, it can be sort of like, if you're trying to make some political point and then you can be, look at this comedian even gets it and they're, they know that you're wrong. Whereas I think that's, now comedians are probably just as divided as anywhere else. And I think that has lost its charm a little bit. And do you think we're, a, we're at quite a perilous point for comedy, Ryan, where you see comedians getting canceled, people making jokes, people having to apologize for things that they said three years ago, et cetera, et cetera? So I'm, I, I think that's probably an example of something that I think a lot of people want me to think that, but I, mm. I don't. Like, I don't feel like I'm a victim in this scenario. I, I think that... Listen, I was in Canada and it's a very small place and it didn't really have enough room for a counterculture. I saw a really cool one going on here that I was a part with aligned with what I thought. And I thought that it was the stuff I wanted to make. I was at places like CBC, which you have the BBC. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to make this kind of stuff and they wouldn't let, you know, it was, I, I squeaked some through. I made like a libertarian sketch with government money, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> But when I came here, I, I think comedy's great. And I, I, I've been able to create my own platform and all these people. And I think that there's, because there's so many people probably like you or me that maybe 10 years ago, you would have entered the industry system and I, you probably would have been more handcuffed than you are now. So mm -hmm. I think a better way to describe it is that Hollywood's failing and they're missing this whole thing. And they're, you know, they they're trying to, they have this big distribution, but they think they can pick people, but they can't. They go, you know, oh, this guy's the hot comedian or woman's the hot comedian. And anyone has a eyes and a brain is like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is a real thing. It's like, you know, it's like if you were running a basketball team and you go, this guy's going to be the star. And then you go, I mean, we can see that they scored no points. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, your thing's connecting with people because it's probably good. Do you know what I mean? Well, I agree with you, Ryan. But see, this is where I I, I am totally on your side. I found myself on countless TV shows going, no, no, you can still do jokes. Like, it's possible, right? The, the, the mob of people in a comedy club aren't jumping on stage and dragging you out and beating you with their pink hair or whatever. I'm not... Definitely not saying that, right? Yeah. Not, I mean, it has happened to you. <laughs> no, but it hasn't. This is the thing, right? So on the one hand, but on the other hand, I also think about this, like you are successful, you've got a platform. 
we've had some success with this. I mean, it has cost us largely our mainstream comedy career in this country, but who gives a shit, right? Because mm. as you say, it's mostly not very good anyway. But a newer comedian coming through now who's trying to make the, the bones in the clubs, who's trying to go through. You talk about Canada. In the UK, it's also quite a small market. Everyone knows each other. And if you become known as the comedian that, quote, says the wrong thing or votes the wrong way or has the wrong opinions, that does tend to be quite restrictive. And that's where I've always sort of tried to, to draw a line between, yeah, if you're Ricky Gervais or, or whoever, you can do any joke you want because you've got your own audience, you've got your own platform. For a younger, newer comic coming through, I think the climate is very restrictive. Would you Would you agree with me okay, there? Okay, so I, I, I've I said a version of what you just said as well. And I, I know what you're saying. It's, for example, you'll see some of these really big comedians kind of say, you can say anything and you'll, well, you can because you're in a legacy position. Right. And... Mm -hmm. And they're they're sort of somewhat immune to that, but the truth there's all there's pros and cons to both of this is sort of more what I'm saying because I'm not negating the fact that you know it's very not it's very stressful having all these people come after you you know it's uh, it's very difficult you're right uh, you're constantly at battle with um, how your reputation is perceived with what you actually say and then how people want to say that you are and you're like I'm not that so you're con so I think that for one. Yeah, comedy's really hard and all <laughs> and it always has been. So this idea that and if you go to back to the what you said about this person that's two years in and they go, well, they can't say anything. And you go, the truth is, my advice to those people is you're probably not ready to talk about these topics anyway. So it is very clumsy. And there is places you can do. There's always going to be a little scene of edgy boys or whatever, right? <laughs> but yeah, it it is difficult and it's 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 a, a different ecosystem to navigate. And I mean, if you go back to Lenny Bruce, he was going to jail for this stuff. And I know that, you know, you have people in in, uh, um, in the UK that have, you know, actually been to jail. And there's other, you know, people that have been fined, like Mike Ward in Canada, who's been fined. And there is similarities. And this is an up and down thing. And especially in the Trump years, it became ex exceedingly the consequences are high. And the rewards can also be high. I mean, that's why Jordan Peterson's the biggest intellectual figure of probably our generation, right? Um, and then, and the rewards on that path also involve freedom, which I don't think there was the, uh, the biggest version of that seven years ago. So it always depends who you are. So I think a lot of people who value safety and to go back to that freedom safety conversation, like a lot of people who value safety, you're right. This co comedy sucks way more than it would before. But if you are someone who kind of considers himself like a, you know, let's say a rebel or counterculture or a troublemaker, I think wherever you went, you'd probably find yourself kind of causing trouble. And so you might, maybe it's more attractive to you. I don't know. So it's just, it, it changed and it's different and probably whether it's better or worse depends on who you are. I mean, what I, I see both of it because to be, to be honest, I am a little bit, uh, polite. I don't know. Maybe I'm not polite to the right word, but like you're Canadian, Ron. I'm Canadian, in a, yeah, I, but I really do see it in a way that I, I'm, I've inserted myself into all these fights, and I'm constantly at battle. And I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm releasing a video every Monday, sometimes every Wednesday too, that is causing it like a, a shitstorm. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, you know, a part of me, um, I think there's the Americans that's the, the, their their culture is way more confrontational. Like someone bumps into you, you go, "What are you doing? What are you looking at?" Like that kind of thing, right? Where I'm a little more, oh, so, so, so I am sort of, you know, navigating how to uh, make my personality fit with the my propensity to, you know, poke the bear. And that's all difficult. But at the same time, I'm, you know, going out on weekends and selling out shows. And you said that you pointed out something that for the newer comedian, you know, I wasn't, when I moved to America, I was, I didn't have this. I was part of the legacy system. So I was doing my CBC shows. So my... I don't know, whatever you want, whatever I have right now happened during this. Like I got popular in America in the last year. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So that, and it was because of this, you know, because I was standing up to this. And so, yeah, there is only certain people that have the ability to do that. And it takes a certain type of character and a certain type of uh, resilience. And I think a lot of times it does help to have been doing this for a long time because you're really, you understand your beliefs and you can defend them from first principles and you're confident in what you think. And I, know how I make videos because you have everyone yelling at you. You start to be like, am I wrong? Do I suck? <laughs> you know? So I think it it helps to really spend the time to get great at this. And it helps to really spend the time to like understand what you think. And that's what I'm trying to like continue to do. But 
I think the probably the best answer is that there's pros and cons, and that depends on who you are, where you are in your career, and what your what your like personality type is. Hey Francis, do you like Martians? Well, I work with one, don't I? Would you like an immersive experience with a Martian? Are you gonna get me drunk on the vodka and f me and my stick like last time? You wish. No, there's this great new immersive experience in London based on Jeff Wayne's The War of the Worlds. I've heard about this. The audience reviews have been incredible. It was rated one of the top 20 things to do in London at night, and 98% of guests recommend it. Yes, the experience features a cast of 17 characters, 12 live actors, plus a mix of holograms, projections, and VR of West End stars. You'll feel all your senses fired as you crawl, slide, and weave your way through 22,000 feet of immersive action, including 24 extraordinary scenes and having to escape 300 foot Martian machines and the evacuation of London. Not the first time London's been evacuated this year. This award-winning experience is only in London for a limited time from the 22nd of May. Over a thousand performances are already fully booked and June is selling out fast. It's fully compliant with COVID regulations and they're offering £10 off of two or more tickets with the promo code TRIGGER10. That's £10 off two or more tickets with the promo code TRIGGER10. All you need to do to take advantage of this fantastic offer is go to thewaroftheworldsimmersive.com. That's thewaroftheworldsimmersive.com and experience a world where we're being invaded by Martians, which is still better than being locked down. Follow the link in the description and we'll see you there, guys. And Ryan, you, you said that, you know, you were on CBC, you had this mainstream career. Why did you step out in that case and do what you're doing? What, did you have a road to Damascus moment or was it a gradual thing? Well, you know, you know some of my friends in Canada, mm. they're comics, you said, and obviously they all moved there from, it's it's almost like not an option. I'm sure you, because UK is sort of the other, the second place probably after America in terms of, you know, whatever cultural significance in the English world or whatever, right? So, I mean, I'm sure you guys know people from Australia and New Zealand, whatever it is that moved to UK. It's like, it's almost just what you do. Hmm. So I, there was, and then part of it was because I was doing such aggressive stuff and because of what I was doing, there was just no room for that in CBC. And I was in places like that and I was just fighting this uphill battle. And I knew that, I knew that there was something that I wanted to be a part of in America for a long time. It just, I thought I was ready and it took me two years to get my green card and immigration stuff and all that kind of stuff. Like that's why they all come to UK. Cause you can immigrate to UK without going through the whole process and immigrating. We have, we, have we like need a, to build a wall. <laughs> Yeah, I know. A, a snow wall. A snow wall, they call that. <laughs> but no, you have to. There was, But I like it better. I mean, I'm a guy that likes freedom, you know? I'm sure there's people in Canada that have their comfortable, you know, essentially government-subsidized comedy jobs. <laughs> they like that. I didn't want that. I, I wanted to, you know, kind of be in these more uncharted waters. And I liked the renaissance against the... Like, I like watching Hollywood burn. I, you know, <laughs> watching Hollywood's new shows come out and they suck and you know me and my friends are making stuff that everyone <laughs> likes and is resonating with them and i i think i like the com competition element of that and i've so i think it's cool and i always i always knew that i would move here it was just a matter of when is the right time and i picked the perfect time right before the country shuts down indefinitely yeah and it's interesting to me you're talking about it because i we feel very similar about our careers like we took some risks and we, we we're reaping the rewards right and it's kind yeah. of the same with you but but the traditional model big risk. Is, it is a big risk, right? right? You potentially ruin your life. Like you know what I mean? Right. Especially if you know they take the wrong fourteen second sound bite. I mean, like I said, I mean you know, some people come out of it, some people don't. I mean, I know people in Canada that were that have had things happen to them that they didn't do. Like I know for a fact they didn't do. The person eventually admitted they didn't do it, and it, they got so ostracized, they got kicked out of their agency they got kicked out of their uh, uh uh manager and the comedy clubs like stopped booking them they got fired from the comedy agency which is the main one that runs all the clubs they essentially like walked into the ocean and just never came back like everyone's like mm -hmm. are they gonna commit suicide like it was very sad and you feel bad for those people but that being said if that was someone else they might have been like f you guys <laughs> like that no you know and someone they might have fought and it just and maybe that would have ended up different for them and they would have developed a different type of audience. But 
Depends yeah. who you are and depends who your propensity is. So, well, yeah. well, this is what I was going to say is, uh, did you always feel this way? Because it's, I think it's very easy to feel this way when you are being successful, when you have a show that, that's working, when you're putting out videos that are getting hundreds of thousands of views. Did you feel, was there no part of you that you were like at the CBC going, well, why can't I do countercultural stuff in the mainstream media? Because 10, 15, 20 years ago, there were people who were doing that in the UK, for example, right? Correct, yeah. Was there a part of you that's like, well, why the fuck, why, why is this being restricted? Why do I have to move to an, another country? Why can't I, I think, do this? Yeah, I think I've probably, like you guys, went through a bunch of different versions of being mad, then not mad. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, yeah I, I think I did go through a lot of those, especially near the beginning where, you know, you start to, you go, what the, why is everyone against me right now? You know what I mean? I, I'm doing a show. It's the number one thing on your network and I'm being treated like I'm the worst. Like, you know, I would have these early on digital anyway, but I, I was having these, all of those things. But in terms of, did I always feel like this? I mean, I was the guy that was, you know, kicked out of school and then kicked out of my residence when I went to university and spent most of my high school years in the office and police stations. And <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then I formed a band and we were the ones that were getting kicked off. I, I was just, I've been a nuisance my entire life probably. Is, but, so if anything, this is probably the most productive nuisance that I've been. When I, I, I essentially, instead of, you know, wrecking my personal life and being a problem in schools and stuff, I think that I've f found a way to channel my propensity to be a troublemaker into probably something that's kind of productive and actually makes people feel good. And a lot of people, I think I make them happier. So I think that that's uh, a, probably a positive uh, move forward in my life, but it wasn't a switch. I think I was this person since I was four. <laughs> and we, we, we're talking about your comedy. Why do you think it's, it's, it's resonated as it has? It gets, you know, it's very, very funny. It, it gets hundreds and thousands of views. Why do you think people latch on to it and share it and enjoy it so much? I think that it's a combination of things. I liked, uh, you know, Scott Adams, you know, you guys know Scott Adams? Yeah, yeah we've yeah, had him yeah, on the yeah, show. Yeah, we've yeah. Had, yeah. He's cool, right? He always kind of talks about this thing where, you know, you don't have, it's not about being the best at things, but if you're the best at three things, you're sort of the, you know, the inventing of a new category. And I, and Tim Ferriss, I mean, I like those guys like Tim Ferriss and that whole world that kind of was the first people that introduced me to sort of a different way of uh, thinking of problem solving, I think, if that makes sense. But with me, I think that one, if, so I'm, I was a really good stand up comic and then I was a really good musician and I spent, you know, 20 years getting good at making videos. Right. And one of the reasons I was really good at making videos is because I was sort of editing music, uh, editing these two, three minute sketches, like their little music videos. And even the way that I kind of looked at the voice versus the, what part of it's the drums and the way that I kind of structure them all like songs. So I kind of invented my own little way to do it. And then on top of that, I think that the comic part where I, I really spent 11 years honing the ability to sort of like point out one thing you know, when you're making fun of something, like what's the, what's really the thing that's wrong with this at its core? You know what I mean? Um, so I think that when I, that was the ability to kind of go viral was I was really able to like isolate what's the issue with, with, um, you know, an ideology or a group of people or a, or a, um, you know, a cultural phenomenon, what's lame about it or what's wrong with it, what's inconsistent about it. And I think, so the mix of that versus kind of inventing my own way to make videos um, and then editing and those, uh, that like kind of combination. And then on top of that, sort of being, having uh, views that aligned with sort of the cultural renaissance. I think it was the combination of all those things that kind of made my videos unique. It was like, maybe there was people that understand, you know, this cultural stuff a little better than me, but not ones that are anywhere near as good as I am at making videos. And maybe there's people that are good at making videos that aren't as good at really understanding these cultural elements and the comedy elements. So I think maybe the reason why my stuff kind of maybe is connecting is uh, a combination of those three things. And at the axis of all those graphs, it I might be the best for that mm -hmm. little niche anyway. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, uh, you, you talked a lot about how your videos are causing a bit of a stir or a shit storm, depending on which one it is. Uh, who is it that's coming after you or having a go at you or unhappy with the videos that you're making? I mean, literally 
every <laughs> everyone, <laughs> dude. People, I mean, comics. A lot of comics is funny when they they get mad at you. You know what I mean? Mm. Does that not piss you off? Because I'm I I that always frustrates me. Like comedians having to go at other comedians. Do you find that frustrating, or is it like finally I've made it? I've done it. Now I'm really doing good work. I think it would be a third thing where I I really try to be honest about what people think and what their motivations are. So I think that even when you're you're doing comedy, I think one of the reasons why comedy was getting weird in the mainstream is they were like being dishonest. They would make, even say like you're making fun of Trump, but just be like, I'm a stupid idiot, you know? And it was kind of, mm -hmm. that's not really what's happening. So it was mm -hmm. caricatures as opposed to like understanding what, so I usually try to like understand people's motivations. And I mean, if I was someone that had some legacy position, and then these this group of people come around that are doing something I can't do. And it's, you know, because I, I can't make that stuff while, you know, uh, basically being part of this club. So I can't make that. And then it's doing better. I think the propensity would be to be like, well, this shouldn't be happening. Because mm -hmm. how, how else would you be? I don't know. So I think that a, a lot of people deal it differently. I mean, there's a million people that message me and they go, you know, they love it, right? A million, million comics that you'll see some comics kind of get mad and then I'm like, you're four of your friends like messaged me, you know, and they're, and I, I know they're lying. I, I have people that went online and they go, Ryan's videos suck, this and that. And I go, my last message is from them was when I was doing the hard times video being like, this is brilliant. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I have a message from you three years ago, you saying that I'm like a brilliant filmmaker essentially. And then now, because the topic's something that you disagree with, all of a sudden, I'm uh, uh, man, that, that sucks that in three years I went from brilliant to I can barely do it. So I, I think that a lot of times if you actually look deeper, you kind of, it's like when a couple's fighting and it's never about the issue, there's always kind of more to it. So I think maybe, I don't know, what do you, what do you guys think that is going on with comics? Do you think that they're actually so wrapped up that they're in the cult? Or do you think that there is a self-preservation mechanism or a combination or how do you see it? Uh, I see it as from and look a large part of this stuff is that you know you're projecting all the rest of it i just think they're cunts oh no let's just cut to the chase anyway you mean like I bitter. Don't, you mean like they're bitter I, I i think i think genuinely i think that comedy especially in the uk it encourages a group think it encourages a system or a mentality whereby you have to do certain things in order to become successful. You get your your, your five, then you get a ten, then you do you your, your twenties in the Yeah, exactly. And then you progress through the clubs, and then you do an Edinburgh show, and, and then, then you, you get divorced. And yeah, then you, yeah, 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 yeah. All the rest of it, and then, and part of that is having the right opinions. It's being left. It's being liberal. It's being all the rest of it. And then so you become you, weaponized. Yeah, you're yeah. just a weapon. Yeah, and then all of a sudden you see somebody who doesn't do that or goes against the grain and becomes successful. It it makes you upset and angry because they're doing it and they haven't done it the way you've done it. They haven't done it in inverted commas the right way. Yeah, they, they haven't followed the methodology that you're supposed to yeah. follow. I give, give you an example that you might find this interesting. So my journey really on, the, on this sort of thing started in, at the end of 2018. I was booked to perform uh, at a charity night for a, a, univers a college, uh, and they sent me a contract which said that they had a zero tolerance policy on about 23 different things, like racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia. The list was ageism is so funny. Yeah, make like fun of a old whole people. bunch of them. <laughs> uh, and uh, when I turned it down, it just randomly became a big news story. Right? Nice, yeah, you're like, get out of here with this. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But and see, I thought I'm like I'm sort of like standing up for the for the art form. I'm like protecting comedy and comedians from these uh, lunatics who want to put rules on everything. And they did not see it like that. Ah, uh, no. Yeah, they're working for the rule makers, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, they're essentially the 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 laugh arm of like a political party. Mm. <laughs> And, that, and that's exactly it, you know, and it's, you know, you can make, if you want to do politics, you can make jokes, absolutely you can, but they have to be, from this particular viewpoint, about these topics. Yeah, I mean, yeah, here, colour inside the lines. Yeah. To, to go back to what we are saying, I go, okay, you know, when you were probably a kid, like, you probably saw certain bands or comics or whatever you're into, where you were like, oh, I want to be them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't... 
when I, even when I was in Canada, what I saw was younger comics being like, oh, you know, I want to be Tim Dillon or Andrew Schultz or Joe, Ro you know, I saw a lot of that. And I, I'm doing shows every night and I, I we're selling out and I'm seeing 19 year old kids being like, you know, we, you're my favorite comic. That's what I want to do. You know, I don't see a ton of, you know, young people right now, or even like, you know, I don't know if you guys like don't know the Nelk boys and all that kind of movement or whatever. I see a lot of kids being like, that's what I want to be. I don't see a lot of kids being like, you know, oh, I want to be one of the, on SNL. Like, I don't, I just don't, I just don't see it the same way right now. <laughs> Unless you were, you know, specifically going through groundlings and whatever, obviously that's the, the, dr the dream or whatever. But so I think a lot of the, the cool kids, in my opinion, so to speak, that's who Matt, that's who I care about. Like, who's the, you know, kid that is sort of the tastemaker and he's 18. Like, what does he think? Does he, mm. who does he like? You know, that's kind of the one that I want. That's who I want to think I'm funny. No, absolutely. And look, when I started in the open mic, it's, you know, a very ramshackle. There was just a lot of the times just a mic in the corner of a pub and, you know, you went and did your jokes. And sometimes horrendous, sometimes it was awful. But the thing that I loved, I loved the most about it was the sense of freedom. To me, it was the closest thing to punk rock that I've ever experienced. And do you not sometimes think... Now, both that, of them are weird. Yeah, exactly. Both of them are weird. But do you sometimes think that this particular movement that we're involved in is sort of a punk rock? It's a sort of backlash against people saying you can't say this, you can't do this and whatever else. Yeah, it is for sure. And the, the, but the, the counterculture of it definitely is, but it goes through phases, right? And, and you know what, how there's that thing with companies where it always kind of falls apart a little bit on the, you know, second or third generation of a family or what, or, or whatever. I mean, mm. when you talk about punk, everyone there that is part of that movement wasn't part of making it right. So mm. if, if you talk about comedy, no one here was the founders that is part of it. Right. So it's kind of the same reason why it's easier to tear stuff down than it is to build it. Right. And mm. there's always a specific set of circumstances and energy and things you're pushing back against. And, then eventually everyone sort of gets in and no one really knows why those things are. You just know that you fight it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They go, what? They go, we just know that we hate this side. And you go, well, why did they hate it at then? And it doesn't matter if it flipped. It does, none of this matters. I just know this is what I think. So I think that um, it, it, there's always a punk rock element, but every industry has its punk rock faction. I mean, Silicon Valley has its, you know, kind of cowboys of Silicon Valley who are doing things differently. The, I'm sure that if you were in the you know, the university world has its cowboys who are sort of not going with the agenda. So um, I think that every industry has its its rebels and free thinkers and comedy because Hollywood controlled the purse strings. They sort of then started to control the thought. And then I think that now that's leaving. It's becoming kind of more punk rock again. Hmm. Mm. Do you think that's going to stay as an internet phenomenon, Ryan? Or do you think it's going to bleed more and more into the mainstream? As uh, my girlfriend always says to me, you know, whenever I moan about this stuff about, you know, the mainstream not being interested, she always says the words capitalism always wins. And what, what does she mean by that? And she means that eventually, you know, the mainstream is going to realize that the, that the money is in the counterculture. Therefore, they're going to bring people from the counterculture into yeah, the mainstream. Yeah, and a lot of them already have, but... I the problem is the system's already changing. I mean, in the last six years, we used to, um, you know, people used to watch cable and now you have watched two different, two or three different streaming services and that's what mm -hmm. the thing is, right? So it's already changing. I mean, the biggest people are YouTubers. So the problem is, and this is what happened with rap music back in the day. I mean, the labels didn't want anything to do with it. The radio, we're, we're rock stations. We don't touch this, right? Mm -hmm. And then now there's, you know, seven or eight rap billionaires and that's why. And I mean, Joe Rogan, Everyone for a million years was like, oh, we know we don't, this is some beneath us thing. And then, yeah, some company wanted to get involved with it. And what they have to do, drop off a bag of money at his house. So, you know, it's kind of, you have to think of it like Silicon Valley seed rounds where, yeah, you can go invest in Amazon right now, but it's it's a, a hundred times more expensive than if you got in at the beginning. So, yeah, I think that, you know, you look at some of these people, I have lots of friends and I'm doing really well. I have friends that, you know, the industry's coming to them, like offering them the same thing. And they're like, dude, I'm rich. Like, I don't know what, <laughs> like, I'm rich and I'm selling out like big, huge places. Like you think you're going to offer me the, I just showed up deal. So yeah, they can kind of get involved by offering huge amounts of money and they also have less influence. And I think that's, 
you know, even with like Louis CK, when he got the deal, he goes, I'm not going to make changes. I'm, you know, so the power they're, they're just bleeding power. So yeah, anyone can buy their way back into things, but it's just going to cost them a lot. And the, the game's going to be shifted by then. Mm. You sound quite optimistic, Ryan. Do you, so I guess if, if we follow the historical trajectory, like 20, 30 years ago, it was the religious right that was like, you can't say that. Now it's sort of the, the newly religious left. Do you reckon 10 years from now, the right are going to make a comeback and they're going to be like, you know what, you mustn't blaspheme and whatever else? It's a tough one because, yeah, I, I, I think I am optimistic partially because it's a better way to be. I mean, you can choose which of those two you are and neither is, you know, uh, sure to be right. But th I do understand that there's so much, you know, there, these are real problems just because it, you know, just because you're optimistic doesn't mean I don't understand the onslaught that's happening on citizens in terms of lying to them and the control and the, the power grabs and the, the thought, you know, control. I, like I do see it all and I do think it's a problem, but I do think that probably it would be, I think of it would be less of it goes the other way. And my hope would be more that this leads to further decentralization. I think that's probably a good thing. I don't know if we see, comedians become mega stars the way that, you know, Ricky Gervais does again. I think that, I think that the fraction fractionalization maybe is a positive thing. So I, I see that the more decentralized it becomes probably the better. And maybe people do own their little corner of the internet. And I don't necessarily see that as a, a negative or a positive. It's just a reordering a reorganizing. And I think that's what's happening in a lot of industries, including comedy, that there's sort of a reorganizing of what exactly this is going to happen. I mean, we were talking about the other day that in, you know, like NFTs and all that sort of stuff, right? You know, they're talking about the idea of, and they already have it, but the idea of attaching like trigonometry would be attached to an NFT where you're essentially a stock and people can invest in mm -hmm. you, you know, as a, as a company. And I'm sure you've seen someone come on the comedy scene before where you go, oh, that guy, that, that guy's got something, you know? I'd like to invest in that. And then you could put money into it. But, you know, we have Patreons and everyone has that sort of thing. But the way that you could bet bet on, you know, the the future of an artist the way you could on a on on a company. And I think that in music, especially, there's there's no way to make money. And the music industry sort of fell apart for that. I mean, you know, when you were a kid, I'm sure you could name 50 bands that you, you know, who was the the biggest band to come out in the next 10 years? Like essentially that is over, you know, and a lot of for all intents and purposes. So I think that some of the, there's just so many, there's so many people that are working so hard. And I meet, you know, I'm talking to you guys. I meet so many people that I'm very impressed with, you know, the way their brains work and their understanding of the world and their understanding for like problem solving and solutions and trying. And I think there's a lot of people trying right now. So I think that there's going to be a lot of cool solutions coming out of it. And I already see some of them and I already see, I, that's what America is cool for too. And I don't know UK that well, but I have so many friends that are just like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I mean, you know, like I'm going to get a studio. What if I ran my own studio? I will have five employees. Like I'll do this. What if we tour and every, everyone's like move makers. And I think, you know, I just got a new studio. So I got my house, I got my studio and then I'm running my little, uh, uh you know, my podcast business and I'm running my thing and I'm touring every week. And if we're all kind of running our own little businesses and I see a lot of people with ideas, then you kind of look, you go, maybe I'll do that. And then you, you know, so I think that I'm a little bit, uh, positive with, I'm, imp I'm impressed with, you know, people's ability to persevere a little bit. So that's, that's the part where I, I still see stuff that people make and I go, Oh, or, or talk to people and hear the ideas they have for the future. And I go, Oh, cool. You know? So I think that that that's why, where I see a reorganizing could be positive and it's going to come up with, it might come out the other end with some new ways of doing things. And I think it already has. I liked, you know, instead of five big companies deciding who's popular, everyone can kind of run their own business. I think it's making better stuff. And I think it's people have a better place to listen to news and better place to find comedy and whatever they want. So that, I think that might continue to get better. Or option two is it's completely <laughs> cracked down. <laughs> it becomes, a, if we all become communist countries and that, that's a wrap on the Western world. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll see. Well, one thing I take away from this is we desperately need to Google NFTs, mate. Yeah, exactly. I've got no yeah, idea. I'm not, an, I'm not an expert at that. I, the only thing that I really understand about it is why couldn't, what if I invested in you? And then, so let's say, you know, let's say someone invested in me when I first moved to New York, right? And then now you'd say, oh, Ryan's coin, his stock is worth this much. So even if you didn't like me, you could have bought 
you know, stock in me. And then now it would have, you know, be worth whatever amount. So you can invest in someone that you don't even necessarily because you like them just because you believe in their growth. So I think that yeah. that's like potential pos a positive of the future. Do you have a website or do you plan to have a website? Well, if you do, then Easy DNS are the company for you. Easy DNS is the perfect domain name registrar provider and web host for you. They have a track record of standing up for their clients, whether it be cancel culture, deplatform attacks, or overzealous government agencies. He knows a bit about that. So will you in a second. Easy DNS have rock solid network infrastructure and incredible customer support. They're in your corner, no matter what the world throws at you, unless it's your ex-girlfriend, in which case you're on your own. You'd know about that. <laughs> Move your domains and websites over to EasyDNS right now. All you've got to do is head over to easydns.com forward slash triggered and use our promo code, which is of course triggered as well, and you will get 50% off the initial purchase. Sign up for their newsletter, Access of Easy, that tells you everything you need to know about technology, privacy, and censorship. And Brian, we, we've seen COVID, obviously, we've seen all this, you know, you know, this nonsense happening, or, you know, online, trying to shut people down, whatever else. Do you think that there is still an appetite after COVID for live comedy, live performance? Or do you think more and more people are just going to think to themselves, why would I go to a gig when I can just stay in and watch Netflix or consume my content online? I'm sell well, I'm selling out a lot of my shows right now. And New York comedy is back and it's pretty full. But I think one of the things that when people uh, talk about that question, they forget is like, comedy is just a date. You know what I mean? So I think a lot of people, especially if you're in, you know, London or New York or something, you would go, okay, we're going to go. I'm going to take out, you know, me and my girl are going to go. Do you want to go to dinner? We could, I don't know. I guess we could go see a show or we could go to comedy. It's, it's like, a, I, I think it's, those things sort of just work their way into, you know, especially people that are kind of 20 to 35. I think it just becomes a thing that people do. So I, there is comedy fans and they'll always go to comedy. But in terms of normal people, I don't think that if you're super scared, you might be like for another two years, I'm not doing anything. I'm one of those. And I'm, you know, not going to leave my garage without a mask on. And even then I have four masks on. But for, <laughs> I think that the the comedy where it's like, I'm just going to go see a show because it's a date. I think that'll always happen. And, and people that are watching, you know, people online and stuff, if anything, it's easier for them to get to their shows because they actually kind of follow them. Remember before, like think about like 20 years ago, if you had like an album and it was kind of, you know, successful, you know, and you mm -hmm. had a little following and people, and you go, how would they even know that you have shows? Like this is before even mailing lists. Like how do they even know? They just have to see a flyer that you're playing. Like, how do you even communicate? Whereas you guys talk to all your fans once a week and you say, hey, we're going to be here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think that it's probably better. I have a question for you guys. Do you guys agree? Okay, so a lot of Canadians come to America and they do pretty well, right? That's a that's sort of a known thing that there's a hot, like a very high percentage of Canadians that are successful in America. And my thoughts is, is because Canada is the mix between UK comedy and American comedy. So com American comedy is very like, almost taking a small premise or taking a, a small punchline and almost making it bigger. Like you almost oversell and British is you sort of try to take big punchlines and like undersell them, almost throw them away, even though they're big jokes. And I think we're sort of the in-between where we a little more sh flashy, but we under, we're kind of still the, you know, the small with the punchlines and sarcasm. Uh, right. Could it just be that the shit ca Canadians stay in Canada? <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. Even <laughs> then, though, but even then, the percentage is still high, way higher. Even yeah. it's not. I'm not saying the percentage of Canadians that come here is higher. Like, yeah, obviously, yeah. I have that conversation all the time where people are, you know, oh, Canadians are all great, and you go, oh, there's plenty of bad comedians. <laughs> They're just not here. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you guys are so great. You're like, yeah, the five of us that you know got green cards to immigrate here. Mm -hmm. So you are right. But even then, there's a higher percentage of even uh, the per, per population. It's way higher. I, I think it's because Canadians are likable. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's maybe a lot there's of, something there too. Yeah, you know, there's sometimes like you see an American comedian and it's very interesting. They come over 
Like I, I introduced this one guy to the stage. Right? I'm not gonna say his name, right? Okay, and I was emceeing a gig. And he was like, dude, I want you to tell him all about my HBO series. I want you to tell him about my special. I want him to tell me all about this, how I crushed this, how I crushed that. That's an American accent, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of the special that he told you to tell him? I can't remember, I'll tell you afterwards. Right, okay. <laughs> and then, you to tell me who it is. And then, yeah, I'll tell you who it is afterwards. And then I went, are you sure you want me to do this? He was like, absolutely. He walked out on, so I said everything that he did, right? And then as he walked out on stage, you saw the 120 English people go, all right then, dickhead, make us laugh. <laughs> yeah. And he played to silence for about 20 minutes. And he came off sweating. He was like, dude, man, that was a tough crowd. He's I'm like, dude, you screwed up my intro. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I just think it's part of that. You've got sort of the American confidence, but as well, like, there's this sort of a British, almost European self-deprecation. I see a lot of Canadians doing self-deprecating humour that I don't think as much Americans do, in my experience. Yeah, Americans have a little more ego, probably, in general, mm -hmm. right? Even yeah. when they're the self-depreciating, uh, you know, I'm depressed comedians, it's mm -hmm. it still, you know, comes with a ton of ego. Really, yeah. it's still all based around that. But you are right, as you said that, I never even considered that, but there are a lot of comedians where their jokes are so funny, you're just like, in America, you're just like, man, this guy's unlikable. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a different style, isn't it? It's a different style. Uh, Ryan, so what's next for you? Because, you know, uh, you seem hopeful that all of this stuff is going to gradually uh, move on. Uh, uh, no, I, do you, I, you know, I, I, yeah. Am I, I putting words in your mouth there? Yeah, yeah, go for well, it. Well, I just don't want to be the guy that's like, oh, this isn't a big deal. It's nothing. It, it, sure. it, it's all going to sort itself out. But it, it could, you know, it could. And I think that you should probably operate towards that instead of towards, uh, it's over, you know? it's. I always yeah. say it's, you know, for example, I think it's just the playing the victim. It's like, you mm. can't play it the other way too, right? It's yeah. There's so many people that are like, let's say they work at a job and there's some 20 year old dude and they go, they're only promoting other people and they're against me. It's like, yes, yeah, stop working there. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, the, the, you know, in Canada, I was part of this system and it was oppressive and whatever. It's like, yeah, move. If, if you live in New York and you don't like the way it is, it's like, yeah, you can move to Texas. And if you're in an industry that's not working towards you, move and do something else. I mean, there's, so I just, I, I'm, I'm a proponent of people there's always an opportunity and there's always um, a way for you to win, even if you think the thing's getting worse. So I think that it's important yeah. to... No, I get it. Look, look, I agree yeah. with you completely. That's our attitude. No, it makes perfect sense. And it's always been our attitude on trigonometry. Like, as I say, we've paid a price for doing the show, but we've got the rewards that come with that. And we're, we're, that's cool. But we also do interview a lot of people, people who are, you know, a guy in his 50s who who started a charity for kids in the inner city, he made a criticism of BLM and then got kicked out of his own charity. Yeah. Now that guy isn't gonna move to Texas, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but, No, so. but I mean, you know, he obviously is doing a press tour about it. He's, you know, he's on your, I mean, you could that, that literally describes what happened to Jordan Peterson, who's now the biggest, you know, cultural mm. figure of our generation or Brett Weinstein mm. or any of those guys, you know what I mean? What you described is legitimately essentially, like kind of what happened to them. And I mean, uh, again, it, it doesn't always work out, but I mean, for, when we talk about, you know, there's someone, okay, so if we talk about right now that there's someone that, there's someone that invested in Dogecoin or someone that put all their money in some stock and now they're, you know, worth a hundred million dollars. And there's also a guy that put all his money into a stock and his family's bankrupt and he's living in a van right now and he doesn't have custody of his kids. And be, it, it, so it's just the idea. I think it kind of comes, you know, when you guys are talking about like, there's a system and you, you know, then you work at this club and then you feature and then you work your way up to headliner and then you get a writing job here. And eventually, you know, that's the system for that. And it's like, yeah, this is uncharted territory. And mm -hmm. it is like the wild West, a lot of ways. And sometimes in the wild West, you get shot. And of course I'm against that. Like, I'm not like, <laughs> yeah, whatever. He got shot. That sucks. I'm like, yeah, this is crazy, but you are right. Like if, if you, uh, that's why I say to people, a lot of times people go to me like comics and they're like, I want to say this stuff. You know, I want to do the stuff you're doing, but I don't have, I'm, I'm afraid of the thing. And I go, most of the time, I, if I know these people, maybe I don't say this, but a lot of the times I know them, I go, yeah, you know, you're right. You're not cut out for this. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So yeah. be honest with yourself. Like if you're the type of guy that 
you're 60 and you aren't cut out for, you know, a sort of fighting, then yeah, don't tweet online your opinions about BLM. Like, honestly, it's so, <laughs> it, it is, yeah, there, these are like risks and it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right that someone's, you know, like uh, out in the, you know, out at a saloon and then just get shot because they bumped into the wrong guy. But you have got to be honest about what the the situation is in the world right now and what what risk reward you want to put yourself into. Mm. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about because let's be honest, all three of our careers to some extent actually benefit from this craziness being in existence, right? Yeah, but maybe you would have been super successful before too, right? Yeah, like, well, I definitely so, would have been. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> honestly, you know, I like how to, I've been successful like two other times doing other things, like you know the the, the yeah. a lot of times the I'm like the whatever factor that both of them have is you, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you, it, it's it that you benefited from it, but it's also you flourished in whatever the environment was is probably sure. a better way, to, you know, to more positive way to put it about you. But it, well, I guess what I'm getting at is, would you prefer to be talking about other stuff than, than this? Or are you happy to just satirize or mock whatever is happening in society? You're not really that attached. I think that when it started, I did feel a little um, it, the way that you're talking about in that you almost, I, I think my friend put it in an interesting way. There's like a culture war that you got drafted to. Do you know what I mean? Because they basically say, here's the things you have to think and you have to say them. And I go, no, I'm not going to say that. And they go, well, then you're on the other team. And I, so there was a bit of that. But I think that it's not so much that the stuff in a lot of ways is irrelevant to me. I'm going to talk about where the energy is. So let's say that, you know, 9-11 happened, right? And you, you, you could say, you know, well, I don't want to talk about that. But if it's the number one issue in America right now, it, that, that, that isn't a choice you're making. You know what I mean? So you can, you can, I think that it's, it's almost like arrogant to pretend that what's important to me is independent of this. Like I'm really into this thing and that's what it is. It's like, you know, there's the culture and there's an energy. And I, I, so you're a, in some ways reaction to that. And if you're a comedian, you want to be, you know, uh, talking about where the world is, where you disagree. You go, what's something that I really think that I feel like everyone's wrong about. And maybe what that is, is irrelevant. And I think one of the, in some of it's both, right? Like I always was really into the differences between men and women, as much as that's like, you would say that's all, you know, the hack version of women are from Mars. It's but controversial was, now, Ryan. Well, that, but that's what I mean. So that was something I was always re like, you know, me and my friends talking for hours about this is why girls do that. You know, just that's something that's always been very, very interesting to me like psychologically. And I maybe didn't even notice that, that me and my friends just have all, we're always trying to get to the bottom of something. You know what I mean? About why girls are the way. So that, like you said, so that kind of became like a taboo thing that I happen to already be interested in talking about. I think I, I, whenever it became to the Trump thing, a lot of times I made a few things about Trump, but generally on stage, I wouldn't talk about him. I would always kind of talk about the issues without his presence in my actual bits. Like I don't really say his name. So you can, so I tried to get creative with, um, inserting the things I want to talk about into the cultural conversation and vice versa. Now, and Ryan, the thing is, like, you know, we are, we're all charting our path. We're all, you know, making our own way. It's great. But there's one thing that we're all at the behest of and we are incredibly vulnerable to. Which is yes, <laughs> exactly. With Finally, someone talking about what Francis wants to talk yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's basically being cancelled, having, you know, being deplatformed from Twitter, YouTube, yeah. all the rest of it. I Does deal with that on a daily basis. Yeah, it sucks. No, I, it really does suck. Um, and it's it's it, it's a bad situation for, in terms of that. I mean, I've gotten like a YouTube strike and I'm trying, you know, I try to put myself into a position where I, you know, try to have a guy there, try to look at what the things are and I try to push those lines. I mean, so I go back and forth on that because for one, there is this idea that on one side you go, oh, you should be able to say anything. Comedy was never about saying anything. I mean, you go stand in front of an audience who has a certain level of things. They're going to all have a point where they're that's too much for them. Find where that point is and really get frigging close to it mm -hmm. and then bring them back. And, you know, that to me, that's kind of when comedy is at its best or what I mm -hmm. like at least, mm -hmm. right? So 
when you're on the, even with structuring, when I, when I write a script, like we're working on a movie, uh, one of the things that a lot of people do is they kind of, one of your things needs to be grounded, right? So um, if you go, let me just make like the wacky, crazy show. Then if your plot and stuff is wacky, crazy, like then your characters should be grounded or so, something should be grounded if everything just, it's just uncomfortable. So there's, there's never no boundaries. So I guess these platforms are another place where there's boundaries. But the problem is not so much that there's boundaries. The, bound, the problem for me is that the boundaries are clearly um, lopsided and they change based on like they're, they're like hypocritical and they're lying. You know what I mean? Mm. Where they're, well, they'll say, oh, you can't do this. But what they really mean is we're just going to censor our, some political candidates we like and which ones we don't like. So I think, I think that that is a real conversation that a lot of people are having right now. And it's probably good that it's at the forefront. And a lot of people have, I don't know exactly what it's like in UK. I know Canada is different, but in America, I probably think that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, these places essentially have a monopoly on speech and they've become to some degree utilities. So there is a point where I would probably think that they should be operating in accordance with the first amendment. And I don't know, there's, it's a tough one. Cause you see all these companies and they love the censorship because they just kind of use it for regulatory capture. Like Mark Zuckerberg's like, if anything, you should make us have more people that fact check, you know? And so essentially, ostensibly no one could ever create a social media site ever again. And there's a lot of people with different, um, uh, competing interests and comedy and speech is sort of almost a casualty to some degree in this, you know, politicians want to lobby the liberal politicians want to lobby the companies to, you know, they say they're not censoring enough. The conservatives say they're censoring too much because they're getting censored more. And then, you know, a lot of these companies probably just don't want to be in the speech game at all, but they're getting, everyone's yelling at them. Like you're letting this on your platform, but you're already allowed to block people on the platform. You're already, there already is, if you are harassing someone, you know, they're, already is harassment laws that I think you're not immune to because you're on Twitter and Facebook. So I, I think that at the end of this conversation it, that the world's having right now, if it got a little closer to that, I think that would be positive. I think that if it became a situation where there's, if it became uh, less, if it became more centralized, I think that would probably be negative. So um, I, I am not sure where that's going to go. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. No, well, it, we've we've been talking about this a hell of a lot, man, and it's, it's interesting it's, uh, and it's tough, yeah. Yeah, it's an unsolvable puzzle in many ways. But listen, we'll save that for next time we have you back on the show. Uh, we're going to do a couple of questions for locals in a sec, but before we do, our, our last question is always the same. Francis is desperate to ask. I'm on desperate. What's the one thing we're not talking about, but we really should be? The one thing that we're not talking about. Oh, is I would say one thing that I've done. A, a decent amount of videos about lately is I think that there is way too many people essentially getting life advice from depressed people. And I think that we need a little bit of a resurgence of the six, the six years ago kind of tech mentality of, um, you know, that it's important to get advice from people who are successful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know what I mean? There's a lot of people that are depressed, their life's a mess, but they have the answers for you. They're telling you what to do. So I think we should talk, we should put pride on, on being successful, having your life together, you know, being in a state of mental health, being, you know, uh, living your life in an optimistic way, rather than that be sort of ugh, like, oh, this guy, he's got it all figured out. I think that there's, there's a, there's like an odd um, people people look highly on people that their life's a mess, like there's some virtue in being a mess and uh, being, you know, unemployable and depressed and fighting with your girlfriend and and all that sort of stuff. So I think that uh, I, I think that I like people that are unapologetically great. And I think that's I, I think there might be a resurgence of that. And I see it with dudes, a lot of dudes kind of looking at guys like that again. I think that, that that's probably a good way to put it. I think we're not talking about enough about the greatness of dudes that are unapologetically great. <laughs> yeah. Make that America great again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't I yeah, not in America. I just think that guys like oh, people will be don't, yeah, you're trying, look, trying to put me put the hat on. What you're saying is don't take life advice from comedians. We hear yeah, you loud yeah, and clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, comedians is a funny one. Yeah, you 
comedian, you go, you got this guy, you know, he's 45 with, you know, five roommates and he's telling you how, what you should be spending your time doing. Like you guys should be doing this and this and this. You go, you, you should literally be looking at him and doing the opposite. That's what you should be doing. That's exactly right. Listen, Ryan, thank you very much. Where can people, if they're not already familiar with your work, which most of them will be, where can people find you online? The Boys Cast with Ryan Long comes out every Friday and uh, patreon.com slash the boys cast an episode comes an extra episode comes out every week and then every Monday and that, that's on YouTube um, and on my uh, youtube.com slash Ryan Long comedy and all my socials are at Ryan Long comedy and every Monday I release a sketch comedy Brilliant. sketch comedy awesome. skit <laughs> well they are all fantastic I really recommend anyone who's not familiar with them go check them out Ryan, thanks for coming on and thank you for watching at home. We will see you with another brilliant episode or a raw show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. Take care and see you soon, guys. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our locals community using the link below.